So, Mr. Dan Klein, thank you for being with me today in the hush pod to have a conversation, to hear more about the work that you do, and really excited to have you here. And I would love to know a bit about how you entered into the work you do. So like the early, the early, early story. Well, it's often nice to be here. And uh, the short answer is that I was not able to find a place in academia. As an undergraduate, I was interested in 20th, early 20th century literature in English, particularly Irish. And there were more than enough people already working on that. So <laughs> the way that I got to information architecture was through the library door. The library science was a place that I could continue to study literature. I was at Wayne State University, which is a... Oh, really? At the time, it was an entirely traditional library yeah. program. And there was a chap there, Gordon Neville, who was a descriptive bibliographer. And the describing of books and the ways that the early 20th century modernists like James Joyce used the modality of the book for Joyce, it was down to the page number. There's a numerology game in the first edition of Ulysses, and you can use the page number to decode certain effects of meaning that the author put into that edition of the book. Hmm. And that's information architecture, ultimately. I just didn't know that that's what it was called. How did you come to realize that? The internet hmm. existed when I was in library school, but the World Wide Web, as something that all companies needed to do something about, started to happen right as I was finishing my degree program. Hmm. So I was a freshly minted master of library and information science and uh, got a job working at allmusic.com. Hmm and didn't know I was an information architect then either. It was only another job forward on the timeline from there. I was working at a, uh, they called it corporate identity back in the, at the turn of the century. So they didn't call it branding. It was still extant company in Ann Arbor called Q Limited, the, the mm. letter Q, and then LTD in the British way, uh, <laughs> even though they're American. And they had corporate clients who they created the logo, the business stationery, the website, the advertising copy, it's like a, a total design systemic approach. And when I started working there, I was a web producer was my job title. Okay. And they were working this graphic design firm for shorthand. We'll call it graphic design. They had a partner that was called Argus. And for bigger clients, they worked as a partnership with a technology company to do the back end stuff with a information architecture consulting firm called Argus, which I'd never heard of that word before. And as soon as I started working in that environment with that role that I was always used to making those decisions as part of producing the website, I was doing HTML and uh, in making the website's buttons it was choosing the names of the categories for how the information was arranged simultaneous to building the website. So the uh, making the how things are arranged and named its own part of the overall effort, I wasn't exposed to that as a way of working. And hmm. that wasn't because I was in, uh, wasn't so much because I was 
ignorant. That's just how the the web was evolving. Mm -hmm. And so the the dumb luck of being in Ann Arbor in the year 2000, working with the one visual design company who was doing enough web work to then be partnering with an information architecture consultancy and me hearing, you know, sitting on the other side of the table from them that all most of the folk that they were hiring were librarians, that the people who were trained to organize the information and make the information in the library accessible to humans, that they were saying that that's a good background for making websites. And, uh, and they called it information architecture. And as soon as I heard that combination of words, it so many things started to fall into place. Mm. And that's what I wanted to, uh, I wanted to jump over the table and do what those folks were doing. And one of the mm. people on the other side of the table that I latched onto is Peter Morville. And I continue to latch on to him even now. <laughs> so do you think it's fair to say that um, a lot of places that are working on their web design work aren't aware of information architecture to this day was that was how did they know uh i think that's fair okay if people know that word i mean i realize it's two words but if people know that word today they are more likely than not involved in tech as their job and that's different and for those of us who have some expertise in information architecture and like talking about it and teaching it and helping people find ways to practice it that has been perhaps in the ways that predictive technologies like chat gpt have accelerated things in so many other fields the necessity of knowing the word information architecture is probably if you, if we pointed at one factor in culture driving the awareness of the phrase the word information architecture it's got to be that so yeah so if you haven't heard about it yet i envy you probably you're going to hear about it because the choices about what anything is called and how things are arranged increasingly is relevant to more and more people mm -hmm. that that is not something it used to be that we would receive the organization system from the library and then the material we generated if we were content creators would be folded into a canonical structure used uh you know widely systemically i think the whole model of how all of that works is changing in ways where the organizing of information the categorizing it the labeling it for me and how i teach information architecture i've been trying to find a way to talk about it that isn't gobbledygook that isn't jargon and the best i've been able to do so far is to say that information architecture is how anything belongs the structure through which we could explain how it came to pass that all of the items in this recording studio came to belong, the ways that they relate to each other, all of that is happening for us informationally. As the beings that we are, information is not so much in the environment as it is happening in us with us hmm. and so how is it that i know how to sit in the right place in here and enact approximately the appropriate behaviors and have a sense that the mouse being positioned to the right of the keyboard is that this environment makes sense to me and i can find not only my own belonging in here but i can posit so many of the actual reason the because is why for why anything in here is in here and arrayed thusly that's accomplishing the structure through which we could do that and some other audio recording engineer could come into here and know what to do 
there's a private way that we could put all this stuff together and that's an information architecture also. Mm -hmm. But the power of shared meaning and that what you gather from this all is pretty close to what I am able to gather from being here around this all as creatures we're amazing we store stuff that we need in things in the environment mm. and uh and that we can do that with one another is phenomenal so i i'm a ia maximalist i think when it <laughs> comes to uh it's the basis through which anything belongs and if you allow that, then it pervades all of the, it's a meta technology through which we access all other technologies. Hmm. So it's just that. You're saying the inf information architecture itself is a meta technology. Yeah. I think that's a hmm. safe way to characterize it. Hmm. It is a technology. There are folks who know how to work on that technology to configure and adjust it in ways that promote more human thriving or less. Hmm. So you're, you do this master's degree at Wayne State and then you're living in Ypsilanti and working in Ann Arbor and you're fascinated by I, or information architecture. Mm -hmm. it, was that about the time that you start co-founded Tug? No, uh, after I latched onto Morville, he, as co-author of the most widely published in multiple languages throughout the first decade, probably the first two decades of the 21st century. And since 1998, when the book came out, there's an O'Reilly book called Information Architecture for the World Wide Web was what it was called for the first three editions. And Morville, having been the co-author of that, once he accepted my demand that he mentor me, <laughs> one of the things that he proposed or invited me into was community service. That the, it's a nascent community of practice in the year 2003 or whenever it was that I was starting to be actively mentored by Mr. Morville. And that through serving in voluntary positions in community organizations is a great step for a young enthusiast who wants to know what it is. Um, it wasn't so much that I wanted to use it as much as I just wanted to know what it is. Uh, and so being involved in the Information Architecture Institute for a number of years and uh, uh, attending conferences, submitting talks and papers and panels at conferences and trying to, uh, m uh, the mental image that I have is mycelium that the, the network wasn't, uh, yet as well established as you would need it to be in order to scratch that itch that I had of what even is it? The answer was, well, you need to connect it all up in order to have a sense of what it is. And so I was involved in the creation of World IA Day uh, for a time there between working at Q and starting the understanding group. Most of what I was interested in was an annual conference that used to be called the IA Summit and a yearly occasion to meet up with people who are similarly inclined and to co-strategize for a couple of days and then fan out for a year, regroup, see what progress is made and keep going. And the, the nature of the progress was not, again, not so much to apply it commercially as to be able to talk about it in a way that wasn't embarrassing either to ourselves or to others. Those two words are both so uh, hard to use to begin with. What even is information? What even is architecture? So the, it was thought of as a bad thing in some areas of the field during this time to, in their way of seeing, to always be defining the damn thing. 
but if you allow what I said earlier about information architecture is the set of structures through which things can belong, well, then of course we're trying to figure out what the definition is because for lots of reasons, but especially the, cause we wanted to belong to it more and better. We didn't mm -hmm. want it to be some flavor of the month. We thought there was something enduring behind it. And that's even before discovering its rich pre computing history, which is another trip I've been on. Yeah. And, and the thought that for as long as I've known you, um, you can't understand information architecture without having an appreciation for architecture and it seems like you is that true and well i smiled there because of being pleased that that is the influence that i've had on you and mm -hmm. uh, i'm i'm the son of a history teacher and part of finding my own belonging in the field was uh, after especially after connecting with morville so meaningfully to me at least uh, his you can talk with him. His mileage may vary, but uh, I've just benefited so hugely from knowing him and having him s hear, hearing his point of view on things has helped me enormously. And Morville and Rosenfeld in their information architecture for the World Wide Web book, the first page invokes architecture as a metaphor. And before we even turn the page, there is a caution about taking the metaphor too far. <laughs> and for a book that was written in 1998, with websites being, if they exist at all, were uh, to call those places made of information that you would inhabit may have seemed a stretch. But drawing on my own experience as a would-be Joycean as an undergraduate, anybody who's loved a book, any of, uh, any of the Harry Potter generation has inhabited that world. Mm -hmm. And that is a place made of information. And the way that that story hangs together, that any stories can hang together, again, why does a certain plot twist ring true? And another one might feel forced. It's because there is an architecture through which everything belongs, in this case, in the story. And there is a degree to which elements that are added have or lack a good fit with what already exists. And so uh, Morville and Rosenfeld in 1998, and they allowed it to persist through two more editions. And uh, it sounds like I've got a grudge there, but I, tr I truly don't. But to the question of, <laughs> of you got to know about architecture as that thing that happens with buildings in order to get it when we're talking about information architecture, I don't think you have to, but it sure helps. <laughs> you and I have scarcely spent a day without inhabiting places that people made because of reasons. Mm -hmm. And again, the idea of, of things that occur can have, uh, they fit in, they belong to a greater or lesser degree. The built environment with buildings because of the cost and the profound amount of resources, uh, architects will often say a building is a really expensive way to explore this idea. Are you sure this is the channel to do it through? And so when human cultures have decided to build durably, the, the difficulty in undoing the absence of a control Z with cement, has meant that those kinds of structures are encoded with, they store meaning that humans use and tap into again and again. They give us information about who we are. They give us information about where we're supposed to go and what appropriate, what is more and less appropriate to do in an environment. Those experiences we've all had in our bodies, in places with physical structure seem to me a real ripe opportunity for 
not metaphor, but analogy that you can analogize, that you can take that experience. When you walked into a cathedral, it felt different than walking into 7-Eleven. You have everything that you need using your human body to analyze the choices that were made. You can reverse engineer out of those experiences the because whys. And if everybody who was working in digital behaved in a way where they had an awareness of that which is architectural in the decisions that they're making, so many more of the products and services that occur in digital would be usable by people in their human bodies through the often untapped rich world of analogies to all of the other experiences we have in our body. That first generation of websites, the first couple generations of websites were brain in a jar. That's the model of the user. And, and the more that computing and technology experiences are freed from screens, the starting with how buildings work and then analogizing or just straight line from there into. So people are making a bunch of decisions about an interface to an information system. That seems like a, an orientation that could protect us from doing it wrong and might even enable us to do something uh, good. Hmm. Yeah. So we don't have to talk about this topic because I know we were talking about this over lunch and you have some feelings about information or, uh, artificial intelligence. And, but I'm, I'm curious, generally speaking in the information architecture field, what is, what are the conversations happening about AI? I'm happy to talk about it. <laughs> uh, I can't speak for the field as broadly as, uh, other folks might, uh, partially through the reticence I've had about all of these the whole class of what one might call predictive technology. It's too aggrandizing to call it artificial intelligence, but that's how it's being called. So let's say the world really cares about AI. Seems like a good opportunity for IA. And the really dumb thing that I just did there, I think can help get, get a message through if to the, it may already be happening. Some of us who sell this as a service have put out there that there's no, certainly no good AI without IA. And uh, the basis for that claim, there are many bases for that claim, but one of the primary bases for that claim could be if we chose to as a field, as a, or just say user experience practitioners, that's a fun. Mm -hmm far bigger sure. uh, group of humans that, that the use of, so case in point, Meta decided to replace the input field and submit button on lots and lots and lots of their products all of a sudden with something that rather than submitting a query to a search engine that then hits an index and then uses a combination of precision and uh, amount of stuff recalled, uh, sort of classic information retrieval science to figure out what good means from a querying and searching standpoint. There are product owners, uh, business leaders who are deciding to wholesale swap out what happens when the input field and button are deployed in the, in the UI and what the argument that UX pr practitioners can make if there was a question about whether that would be a good thing to do, information architecture can really help with the rhetoric of inclusion for what's in the backlog of the product and how to help management know what they're doing through something as basic as labeling. Hmm. If the if the team has more and better info architectural uh, capabilities, 
either through people who are trained or a role that is called that. It's rarely a role that's called that. But certainly there are uh, UX teams that have IA expertise in them as part of their capability set to be using that question of how do we know what we're adding belongs? How do we anticipate the not just the first, but maybe the second order consequences of swapping out a search interface for LLM interaction, uh, the labeling around that, the interaction design around that, the uh, feature benefit descriptions that go out through marketing, all of those can be made less harmful, if not good, through the application of that principle again of we have a system by which we know how stuff belongs and we would know to a greater and lesser degree whether or not this new thing does or doesn't to use the opportunity of rigor that info architectural ways of working and seeing provide to make that which might be done by fiat or through hand waving to have it be named and uh, because wide and when the aliens look through the what's left of our culture um, the because is why uh, yeah that's kind of a dark way to think about it but uh, <laughs> the info architectural sensibility in any product or service organization is making explicit the because is why and if there was more of that going on, perhaps the wholesale thoughtless deployment of new features, not just AI, so-called AI, but product teams have got a backlog of a million often arbitrary wishes of well-meaning but not well-informed executives. Mm -hmm. And by making the complex clear, that's always been the value proposition of IA. And uh, we can make the complex clear through labeling and making the implicit structures explicit. <laughs> every uh, every day at the same time, we get this announcement. It's like last call. <laughs> Do, they should play the last dance, the <laughs> yeah. disco tune. Yes. <laughs> so you've had a robust career and looking back have there any been any um with maybe with tug any really challenging projects that you got through and that was incredibly rewarding yeah it's hard not to say all of them right the the to my co-founder bob royce is great consternation when we started the company and started selling information architecture the sense was that once we did that a couple of times that our product offering and service offering would become defined in a way where you could sell largely uh, what you sold before that we could develop a typology of approaches to kinds of situations that our would-be clients find themselves in and then that the sales and marketing process could be like you sell or market anything mm -hmm. and uh what tr how it turned out is that each situation presents itself so uniquely and uh perhaps this won't always be the case but because especially when we started 12 years ago, information architecture as a consulting service that you decide to purchase and add to whatever else you're doing, that is such a small subset of companies that even know about that or would want to, that, that it ends up being the weirdest projects ever. Hmm. Cause there's, there's a, there's a, you've got a earache well, there's an ear, nose, and throat doctor. Oh, you've got a foot ache. Well, there's a podiatrist. Oh, and the specialization of information architecture, again, if you allow what I said, it's, oh, it's not much, just the 
structures through which everything belongs to something like that's uh that has to be discovered and then created in every environment with such exquisite care hmm. that 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 is so every time it's a struggle from the hearing about the opportunity to putting together a scope of work that sells something that is f priced in a way that's fair that delivers the kinds of results that the it's really hard mm -hmm. and then when you show up and somebody and 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 show us an example of how you've done this for someone else can't well surely you could show us something that would give us a sense and and through the combination of non-disclosure agreements which we honor uh to the letter of course right and and then the fact that any of the deliverables that we make are so keyed to the specific environment that we're working in that they make absolutely no sense as pictures they don't work as pictures they're all models and that's something I, I would like for us to have realized sooner but there's Mark Twain is purported to have said everything including that there's something <laughs> that a man holding a cat by the tail knows that can be known no other way and uh, through holding the cat of how are we gonna s uh, deliver what we sold here in a way that we can all walk out of here with uh, not in shame but with our heads held high and the team celebrating and we got our first real glimpse of that our first talk about so our first job was for a huge travel website and they had a ux agency of record they had a huge in-house ux team seo consultants platform team they had it all <clears throat> and the thing that nobody wanted to do was develop the recommendation for and the structural design to implement why the address bar is the way that it is so you could go travelcompany.com slash maui or is it slash hawaii slash maui or is it slash products slash uh air there it wasn't an engineering question through rewrites in the server it could say those urls if they needed to do stuff for the system they could still do it so the question was people interact with the address bar the search engine seemed to care about the form of these addresses these are the addresses that are going to be crawled these are the ones that will be on people's business cards this is potentially what a travel mm. agent back when we had those which we don't anymore but this was the front end to a saber backed system and if anybody's ever worked in anything digital and travel saber is the back end to pretty much all of it or used to be and so mm. so yeah come up with the because is why uh, on what basis does anything belong? And all of the other disciplines didn't want it because uh, there's accountability. And we took it. We had a friend at that company and we needed work. We were brand new. This is literally mm -hmm. our first job. And we put together a recommendation with Because Is Why using models. And there was a 400 pound gentleman who was a key member of this team. And, and this is sounds sizest. I, I don't, I guess it's the size of the celebration. How much celebration can one person on a team bring? This guy could bring a ton <laughs> and he was dancing wow. at our presentation. He was up at the whiteboard with us when we were going through what, so what is it and why? And just the way that he lit up, uh, that was, that was, that was amazing. And we've had that moment so many times, maybe mm. not literally dancing, wow. maybe not that much human uh, uh, activity as the celebration enactment, as it were. But uh, it's because the whenever you're working on the information architecture, uh, it's dangerous. There, I've heard the phrase, I love it, a load-bearing bug in software. Like, yeah, you can't fix that bug. It's load-bearing. There are lots of other things mm -hmm. the system does that if you fix that, it would break other things. If you're working on the reasons how anything belongs, then it's fundamental to what you're doing that important stuff might inadvertently be excluded.
or demoted or inappropriately promoted. So uh, uh, what you need to, to work in those environments then is two things. And back to the business owner's sadness about this, running an IA agency is you need an absolutely custom scope of work every time. And you need modeling to be the thing you do constantly, uh, not specifying, not diagramming, not indicating so much as I use the Dave Gray. He's a Dave you should talk to for sure. <laughs> uh, Dave Gray's distinction between models and anything else and models are to play with. Hmm. And it's only through playing with the structures that govern what can and can't belong that the consequences can be anticipated well and that the goodness of fit can really be accomplished is not through. And also the other thing that I learned the hard way is that any masterminding of any sort uh, is garbage and needs to be preempted and prevented in your process. Hmm. As the lone builder of websites back in the day, as the all-powerful god of bringing the technology to bear, the I didn't want collaborators. They'd just mess it up. They'd break it. And as I, in my beginning times as an information architect, I think that was my sensibility as well as, no, just let me do it. Mm. Uh, yep, I'll take that into my scope. Nope. Uh, I'll regenerate the diagram. Give me, you know, 20 minutes or whatever. And our success with doing stuff that's good with our clients has only increased and gotten more durable and enjoyable to achieve through the many people, through the enabling as many right. people to make it together as possible. Mm -hmm. And that is, again, a standard scope of work that anticipates the way that something might always be done. You can't, you can't, to, to build a scope of work that has that many interdependencies with multiple architects on our side and multiple stakeholders, tens, twenties, thirties of stakeholders on the client side and maybe hundreds of end use situational prototyping tests. Hmm. Or, hmm. Yeah. So the more we, the better, the more play with it, not declare it the better mm. and just give up on the idea that you can have a a way to do IA that you just open the box and it starts to go I think you have to build the box first mm. models are to be played with that's yeah. that's the okay yeah I, and I like once that. you stop playing with it then it can revert back to being a diagram or a map but to protect it through again the how does IA help generally? Well, everything needs to have a name and the because why of everything's name and how the names relate to all of the other names. That's so much of the value that we bring. And that's, that's one of those labels that if we can clarify it, uh, it's not the waggy finger of don't call it a diagram. Cause it's not that it's no, we're, don't trust this like you would trust a map to go to a specific place. You're not there yet. Hmm. Right. And to celebrate that to, yeah. Hmm. And you've mentioned because why multiple times. Can you un unpack that? Yeah. Huh? Yeah. I, uh, one of the places that that comes from is the sense that I have that any information architecture work is uh, applied philosophy. And unlike maybe other design disciplines that have objective criteria or empirical, uh, there's nothing that's objective, but that have empirical criteria that they can use normatively to say what good means the structures one of the definitions of philosophy that i like is by a guy named whitaker who said that philosophy is accomplishing structures 
that allow connection between the mind and God. Hmm. And uh, I think any IA work is that, and we bracket hmm. mind and God and put organization and cultures, sensibilities, or uh, what the stakeholders want in the first set of brackets, and then what the deployed technology we know how to build can do. Hmm. That it's the, so that's the because why is the, the rationalization, the explanation for why anything is showing up the way that it shows up because those structures we accomplish that are the information architecture exist in a way that goes beyond any one document, any one interface. Uh, they're so hard to pin down that the because whys ultimately are encoded in the, the thing you're making if you're making it well. Hmm. My favorite teacher is Richard Saul Werman, and his teacher was a Lewis Kahn, the architect. And Kahn said that, listen, Starbucks is closing again. <laughs> Kahn had a thing that he talked about, about uh, when you look at a leaf, the story of how the leaf was made is in the leaf. Hmm. That the... That, that everything in nature has the story of its making structurally encoded in itself hmm. and that we could make that choice ourselves. That the, uh, the story about why something came to be, that when you get in touch with that through, so through navigating, we did some work for the Kresge Foundation. Oh, yeah. And they are amazingly powerful philanthropy, mostly in North America. And they have a mission to, uh, a really specific mission to accomplish in cities is where they focus their mm. efforts. And so a complete redesign of their website, of how they show up digitally, the choices that were recommended to them through the work that my company tug did with q that company that i were that i first started working at we still work with them the work that we were able to do to, together for this philanthropy had the values of the organization embedded in the reasons why the labels were labeled the way that they were and the decisions about what is more and less prominent were attempted to the extent possible to track with the statements that the organization made about its giving priorities and sort of a as above so below aspiration that when you look at our website the things that are more important on the website are the things that are more important to us organizationally mm, yeah and that sounds so dumb that sounds like the dumbest thing ever, and it's almost never yeah. accomplished. Right. And uh, I don't know that we got there entirely, but it it felt uh, it was it was a really good project. And the because is why in philanthropy are always front and center. And so mm. those that's why I love working with any sort of an organization. The universities oftentimes, not always, have their purpose front and center. Sometimes commercial businesses have a really crystal clear sense of that. And, and so it's not that uh, you can only do good information architecture in nonprofit and do goodery uh, domains, but it may be the case that you can only do good information architecture in a context where the reasons for how and why things are the way that they are need to be explicit. And not just some, but every decision mm. uh, being an explicit because why that you could, I could take my hand and make a pointer finger and on a couple of models, I could trace the almost like it'd be like watching an animation. If you played the 
Figma file over time. The development of the because is why. And, and, and certainly not all products and services believe that they have the luxury of an explicit because why for everything that shows up. And, uh, and it shows. Interesting. So because why really is like a, a rudder for helping you work with clients to bring out uh, clarity for understanding. Yeah, that's a great way to put it. Because clarity and in, in terms of what? There isn't claritas it mm -hmm. as, as a concept, but any instantiation of clarity, that which is being made clear is, uh, at least when we do it, our process has three chunks. It always starts with what good means, mm. and then it moves into where things go, and then it concludes with how places work. Hmm. You take a placeful point of view on evaluating it as built, as a built system that is up and running. How should you think about it when you're trying to evaluate it? We choose a set of lenses like the ones you would use to evaluate a building. But starting with what good means isn't, uh, again, there's no such thing as objective as far as we're concerned. It's always a highly contextualized good. And uh, mm -hmm. sometimes it's, <coughs> excuse me, we've had 70 plus stakeholders is the top end of the, how, how does this scale? If you develop a shared specific definition of what good means for the project and then you're rationalizing all of your decisions because why back into that definition of what good means uh, the the biggest we've been able to scale that to is 70 plus deciders hmm. in a global organization with thousands of websites they were trying to consolidate down to maybe a hundred or so hmm. and that most of those websites were offered in 20 plus languages just the 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 biggest scale thing that I've ever been in you know invited to work on so far and and that process is the same one we use with a two-person mom-and-pop shop in mm -hmm. defining what good means and uh, and that's why when people ask us about a project that has failed we really don't have much to talk about the two instances that loom largest are times when we didn't use that process to try to help out a friend. Oh, yeah. And the lesson there, of course, is don't insult your friends by cheapening mm -hmm. your process or cutting corners or skipping bits. Yeah, when you start with what good means, you can look at that as a way to make sure that all of your projects succeed because that is the satisfaction criteria isn't you delivered the site map. It's that all of the because whys for where the, all of the stuff in that map is positioned has been rationalized back into the picture of what good means that the stakeholders created with us three months prior to then, okay, here's the model that encompasses the recommendation Oftentimes, it's a three-month process for us to get from what good means to where things go and how does it work like a place. And, uh, and we don't, we've never had a project stopped and not been paid, hmm. which in graphic design, uh, right. oh my God. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, fascinating. Yeah. So we, um, maybe to close things out here. We have a lot of students, MSU, who are in UX and other similar kinds of programs, and they're, they're wanting experience and, and a lot of times getting experience, with, which is good while they're studying here. But what kinds of advice would you give to a college-aged college student who uh, wants to get into the field that you're in? I think that the value of a university-based degree, I'm not just saying this because of where I'm sitting when I'm, when I'm saying it, I believe it, that the value of a university-based 
degree in something like experience architecture like you all have here or uh, informatics or interaction design that that is a far more valuable way to uh, get real serious real quick in this field even while there are people from every field who get great jobs doing really cool stuff in UX the job market has been cratering uh, even while the number of teams building digital products and services continues to grow, it seems to be some kind of a weird shell game hmm. of opportunistic waves of maybe stakeholder face or a shareholder rather facing acts of corporate belt tightening, the theater of, of all of that. So to insulate yourself from those effects, the the indestructibility of a university education in this in this uh two things you ought not get me started on one <laughs> is so-called ai and the other thing is the subscription model the way that we don't have things you and i dave we don't have things anymore hmm. my watch uh is a service that i'm renting mm -hmm. uh, if you drive a certain kind of car, you might purchase the vehicle, but whether or not you can use the heated seats is a matter of a subscription that you, so that's, mm -hmm. that's a, that's a side trail. We'll take that out in post, but uh, <laughs> the indestructibility of a liberal arts edu education of knowing how to know stuff of learning how to learn about stuff mm -hmm. is absolutely invaluable. And the kinds of connections that you make with your, again, I'm just talking about what I do know, which is that uh, remaining in touch with the faculty in your program and using, uh, straight up using their networks to find the, to find your own belonging in this field. There's an information architecture to this whole question that we're hmm. uh, raising and uh, speaking into, which is there is a job market. It seems to have really lucrative and interesting opportunities for some but not all people. How do we make sure that we're maximally eligible for those? It's by being able to be a terrific uh, learner. Hmm. And, and maybe it is relevant to what we we're saying about having things. Uh, what you are able to possess through your education through being curious and then satisfying your curiosity through an active process that you direct which is playing the university course catalog like an instrument uh making it honk the way that it sounds <laughs> nice to you not being so concerned about getting out in four semesters and again just a cocoon of privilege through which I can barely see you. I'm saying this from, but uh, I realize many people can't afford to play the course catalog like an instrument, but what an opportunity when you're young to have access to a university and to learn how to learn and to know how to know. And General Assembly, boot camps, there are a lot of, uh, I, I, I teach a six week introduction to information architecture course online. There's plenty of things that you can do that help, but that is no substitute for uh, the intensity of a degree program from a university. If someone were to want to take that course, where would they find it? You can go to theunderstandinggroup.com and there's a option that says learn with us and there's a whole host of cool workshops okay. the one that i teach is intro introduction to information architecture awesome dan thanks so much it's a delight <laughs> thank you for having me